I am now going to read a Q&A from you. <laughs> All right. It was a good idea. It just didn't work out. So we're going to set this here. Q&A. Uh, we're from Jelena in Minnesota. Do you remember the first moments when the idea of Red Rising clicked and you were serious about writing it down? Um, I do. I was reading Antigone and I was climbing in the Pacific Northwest with friends and uh, you know, I think everything comes kind of in a common pot so I'd always, already had read like Ender's Game, a lot of Roman stuff. And I remember wishing that, my, uh, that there was less gravity um, because um, the climb was so horrible and I had these like big you know, crampon boots on and they, they looked like grab boots and I thought about grab boots and I thought about um, the, the gravity being less on Mars and then I went home and then um, started writing Red Rising that day um, when, once we got back and it was um, the first line of uh, there is a flower that grows on Mars it is red and harsh and fit for our soil uh, they call it Haymanthus it means blood blossom and then after that, the whole tone of Red Rising kind of started forming in my head. So from Merlion in Oregon, how do you plan battle scenes? They are so realistic, strategic, and full of moves and counter moves. Do you block it out frame by frame, or do you info dump what you see in your head and then polish it at the end? I mostly try to find a visual that I don't believe that I've shown before or a... Um, engagement that I haven't shown before because I want it to be different even if some of them are similar um, I want them to feel fresh so I sort of figure out what I've done before sometimes and then end up um, basically thinking about the concept until I have a very fixed visual in my head and from there I'll have like two or three things I want to see and sort of structure the, um, well, the characters around ob objectives so I don't block it out really. I try to uh, establish what the characters need and how other characters are gonna try to stop them from getting it. And once I have that kind of emotional conflict, then I try to do the bigger stuff. Um, but honestly, I, I do a really dumb version and then I go back and paint over it again. From Tara in California. If you could write a short story from the perspective of any character who hasn't had a POV yet, which character would you choose and what part of their life story would you write about? Simple, Sophocles, and I would talk about his never-ending search for jelly beans, and which was his favorite, and what happened when he found uh, one of those Harry Potter jelly beans, Bogart's Every Flavored Beans, um, and how much he loves the earwax one. <laughs> and Cavax was, of course, delighted, because then he had you know, an earwax remover on, on, uh, on staff. So we have Alex in Washington. What has been your favorite planet or moon to create the setting and write about? Honestly, in, in Lightbringer, we get to explore planets and moons that have not been previously focused on. And there's a few in here, and, and at the end of all this, you'll get to see this um, uh, beautiful map drawn by Joel Daniel Phillips, the art master uh, artificer. And um, I think that Io was a particularly interesting one, but Europa as well, uh, mostly because they continued to evolve in my head. Um, because they weren't terraformed like a lot of the planets on the interior uh, in the core, so I had to devise uh, additions to them based on research I got to do uh, of the planets themselves, and uh, they ended up being pretty neat, I think. But uh, also, I think that uh, Mercury was a lot of fun simply because it was created to be an epic stage for you know, some of the great battles of the series. So from Griffin in Washington, if you were to swap the deaths of two characters in the series, who would they be? Why? Oh, swap the deaths. Um, I'm going to pass on that until I have a good idea. Uh, so from Jonathan in California, what's the strangest thing you've ever done to get over writer's block? Uh, huh. I went into... <laughs> <laughs> Quiet on set. I had, I one time went into an isolation tank because um, I was trying to figure out like what Daryl would be thinking when he was in the Jackal's box. And I went into an isolation tank for a, a long while. And, uh, but I, it didn't go as planned because I ended up getting saline solution that you're floating in. in it's a deprivation tank, sorry. I ended up getting saline solution in my eyes, so I'm just in there just like you know, miserably like squinting and like having eyes stung by the saline. Plus my friend booked us for a time that was like three hours long, and I thought it was an hour long. 
And so I'm in there thinking, am I going insane? <laughs> but I, but I, I didn't want to like wimp out and leave. Oh man, when I got out of there, I was so happy. Like it was awful, uh, <laughs> awful. Uh, but it helped me get over writer's block, I guess. So it worked. I've also hung upside down like a bat for a while because uh, I thought like maybe if all the, the blood was in my head, it would help. Uh, I don't know if that one worked. Uh, so from many howlers, can you tell us? Uh, no, 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 skip that one. Uh, from Coda in Washington. What is in the box for howler initiation? From the chant, finish the bucket or get the box. Maybe you'll find out, maybe you won't. Uh, from Joshua in Kentucky, why does everyone hate on Lysander? He's the closest thing to an iron gold we've seen spawned from within the society itself and while remaining a supporter of the society. Am I crazy for sometimes wondering if he isn't necessarily the villain? Um, I think it's a matter of perspective. I don't think you're crazy for wondering if he isn't the villain. I think the whole point is to create this argument. I think Lysander is hated on, as, as I've said before, because of what some people view as hypocrisy. And Darrow is Darrow's easier to love than Lysander is in many ways, because Darrow is at least consistent. Whereas Lysander negotiates and barters with himself so much that it can be very frustrating as a reader. Plus, I mean, he, he would be the villain, well, if he, if he takes certain actions and, you know, uh, ah, can't do spoilers. He could be the villain, he may not be the villain. It all depends on certain actions. And I, I do think that almost every character is redeemable up to a point. So what that point is for each individual, you know, um, that's a matter of taste and a matter of your own moral creed, I suppose. But I personally think he's a very fascinating character. But even characters like Roke, who other people, you know, de develop like subreddits to hate on, I love. Um, I love him because he draws that emotion out. It doesn't mean I support his actions, but they're a pleasure sometimes to write the ones who are the betrayers or who are weaker than they suppose they are. Uh, from Dallas and Washington. If you were selected for a planetary colonization expedition, what job role would you be given? <laughs> I don't know, I'd probably be like the drunken bard who entertains everyone. Or like uh, like janitorial, I think. I'd be really good at that. Um, I'd be worried if I had to fly a ship. Um, like I'm pretty good at like first person shooter games, but I'm not really good at driving games. But honestly, my favorite one would be like some sort of um, biologist or botanist uh, working you know outside like, like a dangerous zone. there might be you know, dangerous flora and fauna. I'm imagining like huge Venus fly traps that try to catch you and you have to dodge them. Uh, apparently my world that I'd be colonizing is kind of like Mario, but it sounds cool. From Colleen in California, there's so many plots and subplots at play. What's your outlining and planning and processing like? Well, if Trisha were here, she would laugh because my outlining is kind of notoriously bad at this point. Uh, for Lightbringer, I actually did have like a 20 page outline, but I, I started writing and then I kind of like disagreed with it the entire way. I was like a grumpy old man, just like you know, pushing things to the side. I'd say I'd say I'm best with like a four to five page outline, and I know the broad strokes of where I want to take my characters and why. But what really helps me is finding out what every character wants at the beginning, and then what they do to achieve it. And I, I'm talking in very broad strokes, like on a single note card, what they want, what they'll have to do to achieve it, or what's stopping them from achieving it, and then do they get it at the end. And if they do get it, how is it different than what they expected? And so that creates a lot of, it creates for me the, the character's arc by knowing what they want. And I don't have to know the ups and downs of the plot because that's all somewhat um, immaterial if the character, and, and often I used to write books and I'd look back on it and I'd have a very intricate um, plot plotted out for them, but I wouldn't, actually be able to summarize in a single sentence what they want and what stands in their way and how are they changed by the end. And I think that's imperative to figuring out anything. And knowing that actually helps me far more than having an extremely detailed outline because it provides a compass for the character throughout the entire um, story. So from Natalie in Georgia, would you rather have spaghetti hands or muffin hands? Yes. They regenerate if you eat them. Yes, you can choose the muffin flavor. Oh, oh yes, the spaghetti has to have sauce on it. Oh my goodness. 
I was gonna say like definitely spaghetti hands, but I love poppy seed muffins. And I feel like poppy seed, like muffin hands, I could actually move stuff with. But like spaghetti, they'd be pretty useless hands. But at the same time, do I need useful hands if I can have bolognese spaghetti hands? <sighs> spaghetti hands, for sure, spaghetti hands. Yeah, and my, I'd be really popular with my friends, and I think everyone like gets to a point where they're like, I've had enough muffins, no more muffins. But I don't think many people are like, no more pasta, right? Plus, I mean, I, I imagine I can change the flavor of the pasta. Like, think of flavor like, or, so I, I have to, I'm stuck with spaghetti, so I can't have gnocchi hands um, or tortellini fingers. But uh, I can change the different types. So like I'd have like carbonara sp spaghetti. Um, yeah, yeah, spaghetti. Uh, now I'm hungry. <laughs> so from Alexa in Florida, can you talk about Cavax and his relationship with Nero and why he served them? Well, the Telemannus family has always worked with uh, the and for the Augustus family. Um, they've long been uh, clients of the house. And Cavax and Nero's relationship is not exactly explored in the Sons of Aries comics, but you see how August or how Nero Augustus um, ended up being the sole inheritor, the sole member of his family left after his family was purged by the, the sovereign preceding Adela um, Octavia. So Octavia's father purged uh, Nero's family because Nero's family was plotting against the ruling family of Mars at the time. And it's a rather sticky situation. Lots of, you know, children and family members thrown out, you know, hover jets and stuff. But Cavax was essential in Augustus's or Nero's rise. And I think that in finding him as a in finding Nero as a loyal friend during their own time at the Institute, uh, Cavax formed a bond of loyalty that seems strange to us when we consider Cavax to be so loving and noble and Nero to be so, well, nasty and dangerous. But in many ways, Nero was a perfect friend in my mind to Cavax and showed the same loyalty to Cavax that Cavax showed to Nero's family. And I think that childhood friendships can often bind two people together that if you meet them later on in life, you'll never understand where that loyalty comes from. So from Kimberly in Virginia, in an alternate universe where, are you, where you are not an author, what are you doing? Um, hmm. I'd love to be like Indiana Jones in the other universe, but ideally I'd have a spaceship. So Indiana Jones with a spaceship. You said alternate universe. I'm presuming it doesn't have to be on this planet, so I'm making the rules here. So from Kevin in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Miss, dear Mr. Brown, first of all, how dare you? Additionally, what the fuck? Um, you said it well. I don't, I don't have any ex excuses. Oh my goodness, this one's a paragraph. <laughs> this is a paragraph. I can't, we'll get to it maybe. <laughs> uh, sorry, Will in New York. I mean, that's an in-depth question, man. Uh, <laughs> it's like writing a research paper over here. Uh, from many howlers, yes, multiple individuals asked this question. What breed of dog would each of the main characters be? <coughs> dog? <coughs> oh, dog, okay. So uh, I think, I, I can't do it for all of them, but I'll do it for some. I think um, Cassius would be a golden retriever. I think Darrow would be a German shepherd. I think Severo would be a uh, pit bull terrier, like some mongrel thing you'd find on the side of the street. That's like, you know, if you did the DNA test, it'd be like 18 different things. Um, Virginia would be a border collie. Um, Victra would probably be like a Bernie's. No, I, well, mm, mm, mm. oh, mm. okay. So like Ragnar would be a Bernie's mountain dog. Yeah, 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 dog. <laughs> we don't have to keep it. <laughs> so Ragnar would be a Bernie's mountain dog. Um, who is it? Victra. Gosh. Um, I feel like Victra, mm, she's hard to do. I thought she was going to be a Bernie's mountain dog, but I wanted to keep that for Ragnar. Uh, I've done a good amount. I think the jackal would be uh, a chihuahua. From Cody in Washington. 
Would you rather fight one duck-sized Ragnar or five Ragnar-sized ducks? See, Will from New York in your paragraph, these are the kind of questions I want. <laughs> I, would I would rather fight one duck-sized Ragnar as opposed to five Ragnar-sized ducks. Um, honestly, because I've done some research on certain parts of ducks' anatomies, and I don't need to see it any bigger. Get your mind out of the gutter. From George in Pennsylvania, do you know what the last scene in the series is going to be? Yes, I do. And I think it's really pretty neat. I hope you guys agree. But that's the thing, like things can change. And often they do in the Red Rising world. That's why I don't like the outlines as much because a scene might exist and I, when I get to it, it feels insincere. But for now I have, um, I feel is a pretty cool exit. I hope I didn't give any spoilers away. Sometimes you just end up talking and talking and you say bad things. Um, like Sophocles inherits the throne. Um, so from Alex in Michigan, what connection are you drawing by giving both Darrow and Lysander monikers related to the biblical figure Lucifer, Morning Star, and Lightbringer respectively? Ah, what indeed. Uh, basically, it's, it, the connection is, is this person. So Lucifer um, is referred to as um, Morning Star and Lightbringer. And uh, for me, it's the duality in the savior or devil um, and exploring that one man's savior might be another man's devil. And in Lightbringer, I think that the solar system is trying to decide who is the savior and who is the devil. Much as in Morning Star, is Darrow a deliverer or is he, you know, um, come to bring about uh, a dark age? So both books are an in, you know, investigation into that sort of duality. Uh, from Nicole in Texas, if you could bring one character back to life, who would it be? I really miss Fitchner. I really miss Fitchner. Um, Ragnar I love, um, but I think Fitchner is the one I would, I would uh, really um, um, like to write more scenes with. So from Mo Molly in Ontario, did you listen to music when writing Lightbringer? If yes, what did you listen to? Uh, I actually have an entire playlist. Um, I think you can find it on my Instagram, or maybe Random House has it on theirs as well. It's certainly on Random House's Spotify. And um, if you search my Instagram, you can see a lot of the music that I listen to for Lightbringer. So from Tori in New York, if you could only take one book to a desert, desert island, what would it be? I would probably take one that could stand rereading, so I'd take a really complicated version, like Alexander Pope's uh, The Iliad, probably. I think because it's so dense, it'd be hard to get through. Or War and Peace. All right. From Francine in Maryland. Have you ever cried while writing a scene from the series? If so, could you tell us which one? Uh, yes, I have. And I think you'll know which one it is when you read this book. <laughs> that is actually not a tease. That is actually true. 